My name is Jake Bennett. I'm so excited to be here today. I have been at every single in-person Lyricon since the second one in New York City. Uh, so every single year I walk away with so many things to learn and go home and try. And so I'm really excited this year to be on this side of the microphone for the very first time. So thanks Taylor for accepting my talk and for having me. And Aaron, Aaron's the guy who talked me into submitting. So keep away from that guy if you don't want to give talks. He'll make you do one. Uh, really quick, let me tell you about myself. Uh, I work for a company called Wilbur in a town called Normal, Illinois. And yes, it is normal. Uh, it's a bad joke. Don't, don't come up and ask me later. Uh, I get to lead a small team of developers there where we get to use Laravel every single day. Best job ever. Uh, I also, as Aaron mentioned, have been privileged to co-host the Laravel News podcast and the North Meets South web podcast for the last six years, which is hard to believe. Uh, with my Aussie friend, Michael Dorinda, where we talk about all the latest happenings in and around the Laravel community, as well as the different projects and challenges we face every few weeks at work. So if you haven't listened to those, we'd love to have you tune in. And also, uh, if you did not know this, I wanted to mention this, Laravel News is always looking for articles uh, to post on the blog and for us to talk about on air. So if you've released a package or you have something you're passionate about, uh, we'd love to have you submit an article so we can talk about that on the show. So. Today, we're going to be talking about state machines, the state pattern, and how you can utilize those inside your applications to create code that's more flexible and more enjoyable to write and manage, because that's, that's what we all want, right? But before that, let me talk about a quick story. So uh, this is a pinball machine. This is the Adams Family Pinball Machine, one of the most popular pinball she machines to ever sell. And I was at a friend's house in Arizona for a weekend, and uh, he had this pinball machine, had no idea. And if you're a child of the 80s and 90s like I am, arcades were like the best thing ever. Uh, every once in a while you'd have like a birthday party, you'd go and be able to play with no tokens, and that was the case for a whole weekend. I played this thing the whole weekend, trying to beat my friend's high score unsuccessfully, uh, but it was incredible. And at one point I got a ball stuck like up in the corner of the machine, so we had to take the whole thing, take the glass off, take the whole thing apart. Um, and at that, during at some point in that disassembly, I saw the back of one of these boards, and there was like all these wires and diodes and really rudimentary electronics. Um, and I thought to myself, like, how in the world were these people keeping track of all the different states and things that were going on with this really complex board on top with just these, these crude electronics? I, I thought there must be some pattern or something that I wasn't aware of that these game developers were using. And there was, and that is state machines and state patterns. They've been around for forever. Game developers have been using these for a really long time. It's been around since the birth of modern computing. And so I haven't heard much about state machines in the Laravel community, so I'm really excited today to share with you what I've uh, learned the last few years about state machines and how you can use them. Our time together is gonna to be broken up into three main parts. We're gonna talk about the problem. We're gonna write some code that's gonna illustrate some of the issues you might run into uh, that, could, that state machines could help you with. Uh, we're going to talk about the pattern, so we're going to describe what a state machine is and cover some basic concepts, and then we're going to talk about the implementation. So how can we take that state machine and put it into our code to improve our existing code base using the state pattern? So uh, we are going to start with the problem, and it's a problem most of us are probably familiar with. If you've ever gotten sick of trying to send invoices to customers and you've said, you know what, I'm done with this, I'm going to create my own invoice system. Um, you know the pain that we're going to be talking about. Quick shout out to Push Silver, by the way, David Hemphill. A lot of the code examples I'm using today are code examples that David and I paired on uh, a year ago when he was rewriting it. So thank you, David, uh, for giving me some inspiration. Uh, so when we do this, when we get excited about a project, we typically just jump right into it, right? We don't do any upfront planning. We're just thinking about entities and actions. And so when I say entity, I mean like a building block of our software system and an action is just something that's going to happen the way that we're going to interact with that entity, right? Uh, so in this instance, uh, an entity that we're going to have as our main entity is going to be our invoice. And because we're using Laravel, we're going to extend a model to keep track of that invoice, right? And then our actions, what might those look like? Well, uh, if we just think about this uh, really simply, there's just gonna be a couple that we're gonna have. So we're gonna have create. We wanna be able to create a user invoice. We want to be able to edit those invoice details. So if you're thinking through the month, I'm working, I'm gonna add a new line item, I worked this many hours, this is what I did, right? We're editing our invoice. And then we're gonna finalize that invoice to make it ready for payment. So quick aside here, just to make sure we understand, finalizing happens before we pay the invoice. It's important for later. And then we want our customer to be able to pay the invoice, of course. So 
All of these actions have to take place somewhere. Where should that take place? Uh, because we're in Laravel, let's just ignore the front end exists for now. We could all take care of that in LiveWire later. We're just going to take care of the server side and we're gonna, we're gonna pretend like uh, controllers are the only thing that exists here. So we're gonna implement these actions uh, through our controller. So we have an invoice controller and we have two methods here. So store is gonna take care of our create action. So we're just going to take a request, validate that request, create our invoice. Next, we're gonna have our update, where we're going to, again, have a form request that's gonna get validated. We're gonna update with that payload. And then next, we have a single action controller. Um, so these are just, they come with a single method invoke. Um, Adam Wathen talked about these in New York Laracon a long time ago, where he had a talk called Cruddy by Design. If you've not watched that talk, I would highly suggest you go back and watch that, it's really good. But he advocates for this sort of pattern. Instead of adding a finalized method on your invoice controller, just create a new controller that just does this one action. So we have our finalized invoice controller here. The only thing I really wanna call out is that we're updating a timestamp here. Finalized at is set to now, and we're sending out some mail to let our customer know there's an invoice due for you to pay. Next, we have our pay invoice controller where we're going to, again, just update a simple timestamp. And this is going to be a, uh, a mail that we're gonna to send to ourselves. Hey, user who is responsible for creating this invoice, that invoice has been paid, celebrate. Okay. If we take a look back at that invoice controller though, the update method, there's a couple instances in which we might not actually want to allow ourselves to update our invoice. And so when, when would those times be? Well, if we have um, already finalized that invoice, right? we've already sent this off to our customer to pay, it would feel a little bit weird to update the balance that was due after we've already sent off the email, or even worse, like if they've paid it already, it doesn't make sense to update our invoice. So no problem, let's just add a couple conditionals here, protect ourselves from doing that by checking those timestamps, aborting 403, not allowed to do that, no problem. Let's move forward to that finalized controller then. Uh, similar situation, for thinking defensively, how should we protect ourselves from, from situations we don't want to be in? Well, <clears throat> if we've already finalized this invoice and sent out that message to our customer, we don't want to do it again, so don't allow us to do this if it's already been finalized. Uh, and if it's already been paid, don't, don't bother finalizing it again, that doesn't make sense either. So again, simple, no problem, just add a couple conditionals here, abort. And then lastly, in that pay invoice controller, same deal, how can we do this defensively? We're going to say if the, if the invoice has not yet been finalized, or if it's already been paid, don't allow us to pay it. Good, simple, no problem. However, we're like at the Greenfield project level, right? And this code is already starting to feel a little bit gross. So what are some of the things that we, we don't like about this? Well, it's difficult to determine what rules apply when. We don't really have any documentation on this. Any developers that are coming behind us are gonna like, what are these conditionals? What state do I need to be in in order to allow these things? It's not super clear. Also, if we ever want to update our invoice anywhere else in our application, we're gonna to have to take that conditional block with us. So if you can imagine, I, wanted to, I want to be able to mark an invoice as paid from the command line. If you're gonna do that, you're gonna to have to take that conditional block with you and transport that logic around your application, which just makes it difficult to keep track of. And then lastly, we all know this, code only ever grows in complexity, right? So this is the simple one. What's gonna happen next? Well, for example, uh, our accounting team comes to us next week and says, you know what? Uh, we have some bad debt on the books. We have these invoices that have been out there for six months. They're not good debt anymore. We need to just write these off. And, and so we want to mark debt as uncollectible, right? So we want to be able to cancel a particular invoice. Or we have an invoice that we want to mark void. We sent it accidentally, the email's already out there. If our customer clicks on that email, we don't want them to just get a 404 can't be found page. We want to let them know, sorry, we sent this on accident. It's void, our bad. So those are two new actions we want to add to um, to how our invoice should, should work. All right, if we want to do that, add those two actions, there's two things we're gonna have to do for each of these. Number one, we're gonna have to add new flags for every action, so we're gonna have to have a void at and a cancel that timestamp, and then we're gonna have to add conditionals wherever we're gonna update that invoice. So our pay invoice controller, which was previously just two conditionals, we can be like, okay, we can get away with that, now looks like this. That's gross, that's terrible, it's getting even worse, right? This is not good, this, this solution is not going to scale. So how can we solve this? Well, thankfully, we have a pattern we're gonna talk about today. State machines and state machines are going to help solve that problem. So I want you to take that invoice problem, put it in a box, set it off to the side, let's talk about the pattern. So, what is a state machine exactly? A state machine is a way for us to help model how a process in our system goes from one state to another state, which is good for us because it's exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, a state machine, could, put another way, is just a way to help us model our application's logic. So we get to decide upfront 
how we want to move from one state to the next, and our state machine uh, takes care of encapsulating and then enforcing that logic throughout our application. So there's a couple of component pieces that we need to understand about state machines before we can dig into this definition. And the easiest way to do that is by showing you a picture of a state machine, which is just called a state diagram. So this is a state diagram of a turnstile. If you're not familiar with what a turnstile is, this is one of those like three-armed metal things that you, you, know, you have before you walk into a subway or like a concert or something like that. And so it's locked and then you pay and then you push through the turnstile, it locks behind you and the next person has to do the same thing. Um, so we've got a couple of circles here, a couple of arrows, a couple of labels. Let's talk about what each one of these represent. So you can see we have these two large circles here and each of these represent a state in our machine, locked and unlocked. Those are the only two states that we have. And then we have these arrows that are moving, uh, that are they're pointing from one state to the next or even back to themselves. These are called transitions. And then we have labels for those arrows which are called events, right? So the event is what triggers the transition to happen. So let's walk through how this works and, and see if we can make sense of this. So this dark circle that we have pointing up to the locked arrow, or so locked state, just tells us this is our initial state that our system starts in. So we're gonna start in locked, and if you think through this with me, you're at the turnstile, it's locked, you push the turnstile, what happens? Nothing happens, it stays in the locked state. That push event has no effect on the state of our machine. However, if you're in the locked state and you pay, this will cause our state to transition from locked to unlocked. Similarly, if we're in unlocked and we pay again, what happens? Nothing. It doesn't change, it doesn't affect the state of our system. We stay unlocked, but if we push, it's going to move the state forward from unlocked to locked, so the person behind us has to do the same thing, and now we're reset back to that initial state. So this is how a state machine works. Um, if, we were, if we were to take away some of these arrows, these self-transitions, we could simplify this a little bit more to look like this, even better. Uh, so before we go much further, I wanna talk about the main piece of these state machines, which is state. So these big circles, state. What is state? Well, in, state could mean a bunch of different things, but if we're talking about the context of a state machine, a state is responsible for modeling how our system responds to events for a particular point in time. This is really important, so I'm gonna repeat this and illustrate this in just a second. Our state is responsible for knowing how our system responds to an event for a point in time. So, illustration time. This is my dog, Teddy. Aww. What a cute dog. Yeah, that's my, that's my puppy. Um, and so Teddy only has two states, really. Teddy is either awake and an absolute wild dog, or he's sleeping and completely dead to the world, right? There's only two. So if Teddy is awake and I have his toy, and the event is that I throw Teddy's toy, his response to that event is that he's gonna go tearing across the room to go grab that and he's ready to play fetch, right? However, if Teddy's state is asleep and I do that same event, throw his toy, Teddy's response is completely different because his state is sleeping. His state is what is responsible for his behavior or his response to that event for a point in time. That's what our state is supposed to do. It encapsulates that behavior. Okay, um, there we go. So how do we take these, how do we take these state machines and apply these to our invoice problem? Um, what we want to do first is we want to take a step back and diagram that invoice flow using a state diagram. So in order to do that, we have to have two things. We have to have events and we have to have states. Now we already planned the events up front, so this is what they might look like. So finalize, pay, cancel, void, we already talked about those, but we didn't talk about the states. If we were to give names to those states that we, that we have, and we're not gonna go through it, uh, but if we were, it might look something like this. We could have draft, open, paid, void, and uncollectible. Now if we take those events and we take those states and smash them together into a state diagram, it might look something like this. So let's walk through the state machine and talk about how we go from one state to the next. Uh, if we start in draft and we have a finalized event, our machine responds by transitioning to our open state. If we're in open, we have a pay event, this transitions us to our paid state. Now this double ring around paid just this means that it's a final state. There are no events that paid cares about. It's never gonna transition out of paid, it is done. This is a final state for our state machine. If we're in open and we have a void event come in, we transition to the void state. If we have a cancel event come in, we go to the uncollectible state. And from uncollectible, similarly, if we have a void event, we transition to void. And if we have an uncollectible event, we, uh, I'm sorry, if we have a pay event, we transition up to paid. So this is our state diagram. So how do we take this, this pattern, the state diagram, and implement it into our code? 
A little known fact about me is that I actually used to be a math teacher. As I've been talking here uh, to a lot of people, so many people have come from various different backgrounds, it's really cool to hear how all of us have come from, you know, higher education, or I used to be a carpenter, or whatever, and we're all here today. Uh, but I used to be a math teacher, and one of my favorite things to do as a math teacher was take a, a complex problem that has a bunch of different ways to solve it, and give my students a set of steps that just worked every time, right? Doesn't matter what side of the equal sign the variable is on, if you just follow these steps, it works every time. So today, there's a lot of different ways to implement state machines inside of your code base, but we're going to take a prescriptive approach here and just say this is the way we're going to do it today, and the way that we're going to do it today is using the state pattern. So the state pattern is something that's spelled out in this design patterns book by the Gang of Four. It's an old book. If you haven't read it, don't worry, neither have I, except for this part. Um, and uh, it's also told really well in this, this site over here. It's called Refactoring Guru. There's a little QR code. Any of you ever use Refactoring Guru, by the way? Good stuff. So they have a section on the site that talks about state patterns, and they do a really good job with illustrations and examples of showing you how you can implement many different state uh, uh, design patterns, and they have a great, uh, great one on state, the state pattern. So that's what we're going to be doing today. So let's get started with that and get back to the code. What's the first thing that we need to do? The first thing we need to do is figure out how we're going to track our state. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to our invoice class, and in our invoice class, we're just going to add a simple attribute or a column in our database called status. And this is what's going to be responsible for taking, uh, keeping track of our explicit state inside of our invoice. This protected attributes um, uh, property here, what this does is this basically sets a default value for us, by the way. So in our state diagram, we saw that we have a default um, state, an initial state of draft. So this is just going to assign a draft value to status when we create a new invoice. So there's that. That's how we're going to track the state in our machine. Next, we're going to take every single one of the states that we have in the state diagram, and we're just going to create a class out of each one of these. So if we were to do that in our editor, it might look something like this. We have our app, state, machines, uh, directory, invoice directory, and then we have draft, open, paid, uncollectible, void, invoice, state. So we've got our classes for each one of those states. Next, we're going to take each of these events that we have on the state diagram. We have finalize, pay, void, and cancel. And we're going to implement these as methods on each of those classes. Now, if you have to implement the same set of methods across a, a, a bunch of classes, a good way to enforce that is by creating an interface. So we have this invoice state contract, which is going to make sure that every single one of our state classes has these four methods defined on it. Finalize, pay, void and cancel. So if we take a look at our draft invoice state and implement that invoice state contract, we now have these four methods available. Taking a look back at our state diagram, which one of these events do we care about? The only one we care about for the draft state is finalized. That's it. So if we go back to our draft state, invoice state, remember here, our state is responsible for figuring out how we respond to events for a point in time. The only thing we care about in this one is the finalized event. So we're just going to update our status to the next state that we should be in, which is the open state. And if you remember back to our finalized controller, we actually were also sending some mail. I can put that in here too. I don't have to limit myself to just updating the state. I can also send some mail here. So when we have a draft and we finalize, we have a finalized event come in, we're going to update to the open state. We're going to send that mail. Then, because we don't care about pay, void, or cancel, all we're going to do in this case is we're just going to throw exceptions in this case. So if we are in the draft state and we get any of these events, go ahead and throw an exception. No big deal. Let's take a look at our open state and we'll do the same thing here. So we've got it implementing the invoice state contract. Uh, what events do we care about? We don't care about finalize, so we're just going to throw an exception in that case. There we go. And for pay, void, and cancel, let's take a look at our state diagram. Pay moves us to paid, void moves us to void, cancel moves us to uncollectible. So let's reflect that in our state. There we go. We're going to update the status to paid, void, or uncollectible. And if you remember back again, in our pay invoice controller, we were actually sending some mail to ourselves. Hey, the invoice has been paid. So let's go ahead and do that here too. The only one that really has any content left to it is the uncollectible state. So in the uncollectible state, implement that contract, and then again, we don't care, if, sorry, let me go back here real quick and show this. We don't care about anything except for the void or pay events. So let's just get rid of those finalize and cancel by throwing an exception here, and then in the case that we have pay or void, we're going to update our state to void or pay. There we go, simple enough. One thing that we didn't show before that I'm going to mention real quick here is that in the case that this happens, if I go from uncollectible to paid, remember that our accounting team actually wrote this off as bad debt, I want to send my banking team, my accounting team, an email to let them know, hey, there's been a canceled invoice that was paid, so you guys need to handle that however you need to handle that in your fancy accounting terms, right? So there's that. 
Lastly, we have this void and this paid state. So what do we need to do with these? Well, because these are final states, we don't really need to do anything. If any event comes in on these, we just throw an exception. Doesn't matter. Okay. So that's how we've designed the state machine up front. This is going to enforce that we can only follow this one particular path through our code, but there's a little bit of cleanup we can do here. And you might have been thinking of this in your head. When I showed Michael Dorinda this talk beforehand, like I literally got through the first slide of the state and he said, did you think about extracting that to a base state? Yes. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. So we're going to talk about it. So what if we extract some of this behavior to a base invoice state? What might that look like? Well, the first thing I want to mention here is that we're going to create a constructor here that accepts an invoice as an argument. If you were watching really closely, you might have noticed that in each of those methods we had a this invoice update. How are we getting that this invoice? This is how we're going to get that. We're going to accept an invoice as an argument to the constructor. And then secondly, we're going to implement that same invoice state contract so these methods are defined on that class. The default behavior here is just going to be throw an exception. And what that allows us to do is if we look back at our draft invoice state, um, these pay void and cancel, we could just get rid of those now if instead of implementing the invoice state contract, we just extend that base invoice state. So now these go away and we have a class that just tells us the event that we care about. So just to finalize is all we care about. This becomes really clear for any developer coming behind us uh, to know what does this particular class care about. Okay. So there's our cleanup. <clears throat> now, how do we get access to these special classes that we've created from our model? How does that work? We've already seen the invoice uh, class. You guys know how this looks. We've got that default uh, status of draft. What we're going to do is we're going to introduce this new state method. So let's zoom in on that real quick. We've got this invoice state contract. So that means anything that's returned from here is going to have those methods available. Finalize, void, cancel, pay. And all we're going to do is inspect the state of our status at this point, and then we're going to match that up with one of those classes that we defined previously. So draft is going to go to draft invoice state, open, et cetera, et cetera. And if you get down to the bottom and you haven't matched one of those statuses, no problem. Just throw an invalid argument exception to let our developer know you put something wrong in the database. I will say real quickly, we're not going to do this. This would be a great place to use enums. Um, I hate magic strings inside of my code bases. This would be a perfect spot to extract an enum and use that in here. <clears throat> but for the sake of time, I'm going to leave that refactor up to you. So there you go. That's our state function. So what this allows us to do now is just call a dollar sign invoice state, and that's going to give us whatever class we should have, the draft class, the open class, the unpaid class, whatever they are, right? So how do we then take this and use it inside of our controller? So we've done all this work, right? We've defined it with our state diagram. We've got these classes. All of these classes are implementing all these events. How do we actually use this in our controllers to clean up our code? If we take a look at the controller, <clears throat> what we have here is we're really, we're really doing two things. The first thing is we're checking to see, am I allowed to handle this event right now? So the finalize invoice controller is basically telling us a finalize event is coming in. So we're checking, am I allowed to do this? Can I handle this finalize event with the state that I'm in? And then secondly, we're asking, what's the behavior that I should exhibit when I am able to handle this event? Now, the good news is our state class is doing both of these things for us, right? In the case that we're not allowed to handle this event, we're just going to throw an exception. And in the case we are allowed to handle this event, the behavior is already built into that method. So we can replace all of this code here with a single line, drum roll please, da 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 da, right? Invoice, state, finalize. That's it. That's all we have to do. So we get the current instance of our state, which is that class, and because that state is always returning that contract where those methods are defined, we just call the finalize method, and whatever's supposed to happen is going to happen. That's it. If we take a look at the pay invoice controller, this is actually even cooler. Um, it does the same thing. Can I do this? What should I do when this happens? Uh, but the reason why it's a little bit more relevant is because if you take a look back at our state diagram, there's actually two locations we care about the pay event. Uh, those two locations are from the open state or from the uncollectible state. Both of those have a relevant path from them to the paid state. So when the pay event comes in, what's supposed to happen? We've got different behavior based on which one is coming from. If we look back at those in the open invoice state, we're updating the status to paid. That's the same. But we're sending an invoice paid to me. So if it goes from open to paid, I should get notified. However, if we have our uncollectible, invoice state, and it's being paid, we need to send our banking team that message. This canceled invoice has been paid. So how do we do that? Do we need to inspect the current state to see like, what are we going from, what are we going to? 
We don't, because it doesn't matter. The state is going to give us whichever class we should have at that point in time. We don't, oh my gosh, sorry, stand. We delegate that behavior to our state machine, and our state machine will just handle whatever behavior is supposed to happen at that point. So this is awesome as a developer. I can unload all of that cognitive load that I need to keep track of in my head to figure out, can I do this? What should happen? No longer do I have to have conditionals about what state I'm currently in. The class just handles it. And so this is a transition, this is a paradigm shift from event action. This is what we typically do as developers. An event is coming in, what should I do? Right? We describe, we say in the controller, here's what we should do. And instead of saying event action, we say event, delegate that event to the state machine, and now the state machine is responsible for taking action. So we get to program this up front, decide how our application should behave up front, and then we simply delegate those events to the state machine, and the state machine enforces that behavior. So this is awesome. This is huge. I've been so excited to share this with you guys. Um, let's talk about the benefits real quick. So these are the problems we originally started out with. Difficult to determine what rules apply when. Thanks to our state diagram, that's not really a problem. We've got really good documentation on how we should go from one state to the other. And uh, if we want to know what, how we go from one to the next, we just have to go look at those classes. Just a simple set of classes. No package needed. Very simple pattern. Uh, we have this duplication of logic every place that we want to update the invoice. No longer do we have that. All we have to do is delegate the action to our state machine, and it'll take care of it. If we wanted to mark invoices as paid from a command line, no big deal. Invoice, state, pay event. Should it be allowed? Should it not? Throw an exception? Don't care. And because the code only ever grows in complexity, now we have a sustainable way to add new actions to our existing code simply using classes and methods. Nothing special. Everybody can figure this out. So folks, that is State Machines. I hope you've learned something. I've been so excited to give this talk, but unfortunately, my time is up. So I'm bummed that it's over, but hopefully, I get to do this again next Laracon, so I can be a little bit excited again. Thank you everybody so much for your kind attention. Dude, nice job. Thank you. Okay, Thank you. so first question, how did you make those slides and how many did you make? I think, I think the count was like 180, oh. 180. <laughs> A lot of slides, and it was Figma. I used Figma, just drew them all up, and then used the dissolve transition between the two. So, yeah. Wow, Worked first up. talk, you went hard, Thank and you. it came Thank out you. great. I appreciate it. Good Thank job. You so much. Okay, so second question. You, you showed a very uh, elegant implementation here. Are there packages that exist already to help with this kind of thing? There are. There are a lot of packages out there. Um, so Spassi has one, shocker, right? Spassi has a package that does a really good job of, they, they basically take care of uh, persisting the, the current state that you're in to your database. So okay. they have a really, uh, really elegant way of doing that. And you can use the pattern we talked about today with that. Uh, Andreas Santabanez, somewhere Who here. Is here. There somewhere. he is, I see him. Andreas has a state machine package, and then there's another, there's another crew that's coming out with one right now. So yeah, there, there's a bunch of good stuff out there. I, I wanted to just focus today on the really simple, how do we implement it ourselves, yeah. but those packages do help take care of some of that. Yeah, seeing how it's implemented is gonna help us use those packages Absolutely. better. Absolutely. Yep. So, nice job, everybody. Thank Give it up so for much. Jake.